Hello, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 5th. Today's topic is the March Feature Teacher. The show hosts are Peggy George. I'm Lori Moffat. And Tammy Moore, thanks very much for doing closed captioning for us today. So if English is not your first language, following closed captioning is, is a good idea. Also, if you have trouble hearing, uh, the closed captioning is up near the audio video panel title. And again, our special guest today is Aaron Klein. Here's the link to the live binder that Peggy will put in the chat. Uh, the links on the particular binder tabs are on the left-hand column rather than across the top. All of the shows are recorded, and the links are posted on this site on the Archives and Resources page at live.classroom20.com. So all the recordings you can find there. Here is where the show gets a little interactive. Please use that laser pointer and let us know where in the world you're logging in from. I know I'm from central Pennsylvania. Uh, Peggy's logging in from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Tammy's logging in from southwest Arkansas. I'm not sure where Aaron's logging in from. You can also type in the chat if you'd like. I think we do have an international group today. Michigan, thank you. Aaron's logging in from Michigan. So here's the start of our polling question. Do you use iPads in your classroom? So it's either a yes or a no with that check next to the hand. Do you use iPads in your classroom? Hmm. Louise, you ought to be seeing the slides. You are in lag, though. That could explain why. Let me post this. So out of those that voted, Almost half do use iPads in the classroom. The next question, have you used augmented reality, AR, in your classroom? Let me clear the last one. That could explain it, Louise. Once, once all the slides have loaded as people arrive, then your lag should be going away. All right, I will go ahead and post this set of results to the whiteboard. Uh, we have 38% who say no, 23% yes. The next question, have you used digital workstations or digital learning centers in your classroom? Yeah, everybody has mic privileges right now. And again, I will post the responses. A quarter of the group 
have, a quarter of the group have not. Okay, again, welcome to the March Featured Teacher Show uh, with special guest Aaron Klein. I'm Lori Moffat, one of the hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will introduce Aaron and start the newbie question on the next slide. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula Noggle from New Orleans, Louisiana. Excited and thrilled to have my dear friend, Aaron Klein joining us today as our March, our, I'm sorry, our April featured teacher. Okay, for those of you that don't know Aaron, she is a classroom teacher, second grade teacher. Um, she has previously taught first, sixth, and seventh grade. Um, and she is from Michigan and she is very involved in the Michigan Reading Association. She has been a workshop presenter. She is a smart technology exemplary educator, and she guest posts or blogs for really good stuff, Edutopia, Edudemic, and lots and lots of things. Recently, she has been um, part of the Scholastic Instructor Magazine group, and she was a co-author for Amazing Grades with experts from um, 13 countries around the world. She does amazingly awesome things with her second grade. She is a um, great user of augmented reality and she loves to blog and hear ev um, share everything she does on her blog, Inspiration. So if you don't know Erin, I would strongly suggest following her on Twitter, checking out her blog, and she has even been selected to attend a very special event in Washington this June. Hopefully she'll tell us more about that. So please take a moment and help me welcome our very special guest, Erin Klein. Hi, Erin. And the newbie question, I'm sorry, I forgot to change the slide. I don't have that. Somebody else will have to change the slide. Sorry. Thank you. Question, the newbie question for today is what do Web 2.0, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? For me, I use Web 2.0 tools in my classroom to help engage my students, but also what I've found is they really help to streamline my teaching so that it seems like we're getting through more content that we need to, but also so that my planning is more organized and then the children have a greater sense of ownership because with digital portfolios, they're able to add their own creations to their portfolios. And also, we're able to share a lot more with parents and really connect the school with the home. So for me, Web 2.0 isn't just about websites or anything that the kids could look or research on the internet, but it's also a lot about creation and about sharing as well. So today I'm going to share a lot about digital workstations and this is something that I started in my classroom last year and I started it primarily because I wanted to bring in more technology to my classroom but I didn't have a lot to use so I was trying to think of really creative ways that the children could still have their fingertips on some of their favorite applications and tools without um, making it more difficult uh, for me in the planning process into where it would be fair for the students because especially at the elementary level, everything needs to be fair for the kids. So we've already done a brief introduction of myself. I did want to mention one thing though that I am a part of is the National Writing Project. And being a part of the Writing Project, what I most appreciated was every time we would share any part of our practice, it was very demonstration based. So you could really kind of get an insight as to what was happening directly into the classroom without being there. One of my favorite things to do for professional development is to actually go around to different teachers' classrooms and to be able to observe them. I think that there's true power in that. So I'm going to try and share a lot of pictures and screenshots of things that my students have done, but also even the layout and look of my room so that you can truly get a visual picture of what it's like in the day of life in our classroom. 
So I started trying to think about bringing technology into my classroom because I know that there are so many tools available and that intimidated me. I felt like I was drowning and I wasn't even swimming. And my mom said, Erin, you're about the least techie person I know. And I thought that that was pretty funny because looking back, she told me that about six years ago. And I know that as a teacher, I always want to take my weaknesses and turn them into strengths. So because technology was a huge weakness of mine, I kind of jumped right in with both feet to try and learn as much as possible that I could about technology. So I think that it's important that you do embrace your weaknesses and turn them into strengths. And because of that, I've really grown as a teacher. So when my five-year-old Jacob is in kindergarten, I try and think about, you know, the bigger picture. What is it going to be like for him when he enters the world and what skills is he going to need? And I know that it's not necessarily just about technology. It's more about how he's going to use tools to advance him professionally. How is he going to connect with others? Who is he going to connect with? And what is the medium in which he's going to use? And it first struck a chord with me when I was in DC about two years ago for the BAMI Awards. And you can see Jacob with the iPad drawing. We were at a restaurant at the hotel, and they didn't have kids' menu items or kids' menu for the kids to color on. And Jacob wanted to color, which I was glad. He didn't say, Mom, give me your iPad. I want to watch a Netflix movie. He wanted to actually do something creative. Problem was, I didn't have paper. So knowing that it's not about the technology, it's about the medium, and he wanted to color, I said, oh, I can put him on Education, which is an um, interactive whiteboarding app. So it's kind of like a smart board um, at your fingertips. So Jacob started getting the coffee creamers and the saucers and turning them upside down, and he made Mickey Mouse. So he was really proud of that. And then when Riley, my daughter, was in the hospital getting her adenoids taken out, or her tonsils, sorry, she um, was in recovery, and my husband and I received a text message, and it was a video that my mom had Jacob make. And the video said, hi, Riley, I love you. I hope that you're getting better soon. And of course, it immediately brought tears to our eyes. But the teachable moment for me came in the car ride on the way home with Riley and my husband. And I was like, wow, you know, Jacob didn't think to send flowers. He didn't think to color her a picture and give it to her when he got home or when she got home. It was really like in the moment. Riley's in recovery. Let me send my sister a little video that I made. And then in the bottom, you can see he got his trophy for soccer. The first thing he did was he ran up to me and said, Mom, put it on Instagram, because he wanted not on Papa to see. And everybody, he knows when I put something on Instagram, it immediately goes to Facebook and Twitter. So he wanted the whole world to be able to see his trophy. It was his shining moment. So you can tell that even at five years old, just the real understanding that kids have of how to use these tools. So the big driving question in my practice is, am I the type of teacher that I would want for my own two kids to have? And I kind of slow down here because I challenge all of you to think about if you have children or if you don't yet or if you're planning to have children, who is it that you want to be the child that you love for their instructor? How do you want them to teach your children? And for me, this really kind of hit home. and. I started evaluating everything I did. I started looking at my own two children to start with because I know that I want the very best for them and the kids in my classroom deserve the very best. So I started looking, how are my kids learning? What is it that they love to do? And how do they choose to learn? Not, Riley, Jakey, you have homework, let's sit down, let's get it out. But on their own, how are they independently seeking these learning opportunities? And what I realized was, it was a lot of just sit and get. My kids were not in the driver's seat. It was me kind of dumping in that information. We use everyday math for our curriculum, and it was me standing in the front of the classroom on the smart board and just presenting this information to them. There was not a lot of differentiation. I was kind of pulling small groups, but it wasn't the way that I wanted it to be. So I had to ask myself, would I want to be a kid in my own classroom? So I literally walked over to a kid's desk at the time, and I sat down, and I kind of looked around my room. And I kind of got inside the desk and started pulling materials out. And I asked myself, how fun is this? 
And as I'm pulling out the Rebecca Sitton journal, and I'm pulling out the Everyday Math journal, and I'm pulling out the Handwriting Without Tears journal, and I'm pulling out the Reading and Writing notebooks, and I'm kind of flipping through it all, I was like, whoa, this is like information overload for the kids each day. How much time do they have offering their own views and opinions and ideas? And I really wanted to, to be more of that. Some of the greatest influences that I've had as a teacher, um, the constructivism approach, you know, intrinsic motivation, Bloom's taxonomy, getting them creating. I love Rafe Esquith. If you've not read his work, phenomenal. You know, there are no shortcuts. Really getting kids to work hard and be proud of that work that they've done. Of course, Dan Pink's Drive. So all of these influences in my life, I kind of went back to the basics and said, what can I do in my classroom? So I went to the driving questions. What are my kids doing? Why are they doing it? Why do I need this change? And the biggest one for me is, oh my goodness, when am I going to find the time to do all of these hands-on, project-based type applications in my classroom? I knew that the kids would be the one involved, but also I had to have a space set up for the kids. Not a classroom that I designed, but a classroom that the kids would help design. So why digital workstations? Well, I wanted something that would allow for that more time. And when I looked at my schedule, just if you're an elementary teacher, you know language arts alone. You've got reading and writing workshop. You've got phonics, independent reading, read aloud, tier two and three support. You've got to do enrichment. You've got grammar. And that doesn't leave a whole lot of time for science and social studies, math, and any other thing that you need to do in the classroom. So to help find a solution for me was the flipped classroom. And I know many people are familiar with the flipped classroom. And what this is, pretty much, you give the kids homework, which is a video to watch of a lesson that you've prepared or that you've borrowed from another teacher. The kids go home and watch the video. They come back, and they've already received the mini lesson through the video. So now they're ready for some hands-on learning time in class. So instead of doing the homework at home, they now kind of do that project-based, real thinking, collaborative part in the classroom with their peers and with you there to facilitate that as their guide. So I know that it's not about the tool, it's more about the learning. So it didn't really matter what device I was using or what app I was going to use. It was more about how I was going to use it. So one of the easiest apps for me to use is EduCreations. And I love this app because A, it's free. B, it's easy to use. If my five-year-old could use it, I knew that my grade two students could use it as well. So this is where I started. There are many others like Show Me and uh, TechSmith has one. There's just so many to choose from. Explain everything. It's a little bit more robust. But I, I do like EduCreations the best because it's free and easy to use. So I only had one iPad. So how in the world was I going to flip my classroom? And I knew for grade two students, I could not ask my kids to go home at night and watch a video in between soccer and piano practice, plus eating dinner and going to bed at a reasonable time with taking a bath. So I knew that the parents might be a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and I had to find a way to make it work for my second graders. So I decided to do something called like an internal flipped classroom. And that's what I called it because it wasn't external. They weren't going home to watch the video. They were doing it all in my classroom. So I was still able to do um, some of the project based, the hands on, and keep all of my influencing um, factors that I believe in in teaching, but just do it in the classroom. In order to facilitate this sort of model, I only had one iPad, so the kids were going to have to rotate through centers or stations to be able to have this lesson that I would flip. And I decided to flip first my spelling lessons. Because we used a formal spelling program, Rebecca Sitton, and that's what our district had mandated, I could take the 15 minutes to 25 minutes every day that I was doing my spelling instruction, and I could take that lesson and record it using EduCreations. And then I could put that in a center, and the kids could go to that spelling workstation twice a week and get all of the information that they needed. And they could still complete their journal pages when they were in that station. So you can see um, on the Monday through Friday schedule, the T is for teacher. And the teacher means they come to me for small group instruction. So for example, children 1, 2, 3, and 4 on Monday would come to me for teacher for about 20 minutes. And then they would go to another workstation, and then finally a third workstation. So they would go through three workstations on Monday. And then on Tuesday, those same group of children looking at the top, numbers one, two, three, and four, they would go to a workstation first, and then a second rotation. And then their third rotation on Tuesday, they would come back to me for teacher. 
So the kids would rotate uh, throughout the week. And I've actually revised this a little bit. So you can make it. I have all of the copies available that you can download for free digitally. I'll share the link with you in a little bit. Um, so you can kind of tweak this to make it your own if this is a template you're interested in using. So by letting the kids rotate through these stations, they were able to use the iPads, collaborate, work in partnerships together. I had one desktop computer in my room that the kids could use. And the kids would also use other digital tools I had in my classroom, like the live scribe pen that they could record their voices on as they were drawing or writing. And then when they would turn in the paper that was on the clipboard that they were writing about, later on when they were at recess or a special, I could grab that sheet of paper and that live scribe pen and I could touch anywhere on that paper where the student had drawn and immediately whatever stroke I hit or whatever illustration I touched, whatever the child was saying at that given moment, the audio would start playing back. Kind of magical. This was so powerful at parent-teacher conferences when I would share it with parents. The child was in the room and you could hear their voice even though they were at home with the babysitter while the parents were at conferences. So for the mom and dad to be able to hear their precious children's voice come alive at conferences and hear the work that they were doing, not only see it, it really had a lot of power in our conferences to talk about the children's work. We also have Citio cubes in our classroom. These are kind of like, um, they're not really building blocks like Legos, but they are digital blocks that interact with one another. You can get these at Barnes & Noble. They run right around $200, give or take a little bit. Um, and you can get them from the Citio website as well. But we could do math problems on these or building words. So for example, if you had, um, let's just take a consonant vowel, consonant word like hat, and you could have like an H on one of the cubes, an A on another cube, and a T on a third cube. And then when you put them together, it in immediately blends the word together, hat. And then the kid could get validation that their word, in fact, was correct. So if you do Daily Five or Cafe, this would be a great item for your word work, um, working with words type station. And for this magical time that I now had, by removing my spelling instruction for that 15 to 25 minutes every day, I realized I still needed a little bit of extra time. So I decided to also remove my handwriting instruction, and I would flip that too, because I did get a second iPad. So with two iPads in my room, I was now able to flip two different content areas. So this enabled me to have about 45 minutes to an hour of extra time every day. So with this extra time at the end of our day, when the kids would come back from recess, they were done anyway. They were squirrely, they were exhausted, they were hot. So at the end of the day, we had about 45 minutes to an hour. And um, I also have snack and story during this time. So what I did was I just combined snack and story with our workstation. So that gave me an extra little bit of cushion time too to do these great digital workstations. So I, I had the great opportunity to come home and say, okay, Erin, now you have this great free hour, which never happens in the teaching world because we're so overwhelmed. What are you going to do with this extra hour of time? If the kids could be involved in any task in the world, what sort of learning would you like for them to be engaged with without being too formal and telling them, this is what we're going to learn today. So I said, well, I would like for them to have more work with partnerships and really talking about the stories that they're reading. I would like for them to be able to listen to good models reading stories. I would like for them, of course, to be able to do those flipped lessons that I had recorded for the spelling instruction. So you can see that spelling is twice on this rotation guide. So the children have to rotate twice to be able to get all of the content in in that given week. Um, discovery is kind of like a free one for me. I can put science activities here or really anything. If Mother's Day is coming up and I need for the children to work on something, I can put that in discovery as well. Uh, geography is part of our social studies. Um, technology is a station itself because we often get a lot of fun tools in the classroom to kind of experiment with or even to do like the coding, code.org, which is a great one. So I could really kind of plug in anything there too. And a lot of times the kids will come in with ideas that they want to do or try. And I like to be able to have a creative center to just kind of put anything, any of their ideas there. The math workstation, we do a lot of our everyday math games and then they have the math apps that sometimes I could borrow an iPad or use my iPhone and put that one there too. Handwriting was a station that I flipped with the other iPad. So I would record that quick handwriting without tears lessons and the kids would complete the journal pages there. Spelling again, writing workshop. I love giving the kids extended time to do their writing. 
And also, the kid said, do, I know that when you when you start, when you've begun, you're never finished. But the kids, whenever they are truly done and ready to publish with their stories, I like to have an opportunity for them to think about maybe even a digital way to publish or a really creative way to share their work. So they really enjoy this time as well. And then File Folders is the only non-techie digital station that I have just because I have a lot of really good file folders um, that go along with the content that we study. So once I decided to go digital with my workstations, I had to think about what devices I already had. And in the beginning of the year, we spent a good six to eight weeks setting up this, these stations. What does it look like? What does it sound like? And I let the kids kind of come up with these ideas. And I used to do a lot of anchor chart based expectations. You know, we'd sit on the carpet and what should it sound like? What should it look like? We'd role play this. And now I kind of set up um, classes in Class Dojo. And we don't do individual students. We do whole groups. So I would not have each kid have their own avatar. But in Class Dojo, we would set up like a reading workshop class. And then for the expectations, we would just enter those for the behaviors of what it should look like and notice. And I did not assign good or bad points for this. I would just let the kids say, you know, today it seemed a little bit noisy. It was hard for me to focus. And they would be the ones to kind of determine what we would work to improve upon the next day. So after I went digital, I had to kind of decide what devices do I already have? Because remember, I only have two iPads and then one desktop computer. I'm kind of starved for technology in my room like many of you. So I had to start gathering all of the stuff that I had around my house, around my classroom. And one of the items that I have that I really like are the hot dot pens. These you can get um, from learning resources, from Lakeshore Learning, from really good stuff, from I believe Carson Delosa, lots of different places. But these are cards that you can buy and you can get them pretty much for any grade level and for any content area, for any skill or strategy. Each box of cards comes with, I think, anywhere between like 50 and 100 cards. They have questions on them. Uh, the kids could pick their answer. And then the little pens that the kids use with these, if they get a correct answer, it'll light up green. If it's incorrect, it'll light up red to give them that immediate feedback. They also have pens available for lower elementary, like they've got a little cat, I think, that will meow if they get it right and hiss if they get it wrong. So you can get the cute interactive pens as well. The second image down below is a little bit difficult to see, but it's that live scribe pen that I had mentioned that records the kids as they're talking out loud and thinking as they're drawing. And then I also incorporate a lot of websites in my room. One of my favorite is abcya.com. Uh, it's really easily divided and organized by grade level, K-5, and they have a tremendous amount of free resources that are really good for the kids to use. And it works great for differentiation, too, because I have a lot of kids that will challenge themselves on a grade level higher if the grade level that they're currently working on is too low. So it really allows for independent differentiation, which I'm a huge proponent of as well. Um, different math websites, you know, there's Kenmark, there's IXL, there's an app called Front Row, that is amazing. There's just so many out there. There's splash maps, just really, really great resources that are available for you to use. And we put this on our desktop computer for the kids to use. And then boogie boards. These are what I call, you know, the 21st century version of the Magna Doodle of what we played with. And then I guess the Magna Doodle would be an amped up version of the Etch a Sketch. But um, the boogie boards are, they're not really a techie item, but the kids go crazy over them. And this works great for practicing handwriting. So sometimes I would even put the boogie board in the handwriting station or even a sand tray for the kids to draw their letters in sand. But the boogie boards um, are just something that you can write on similar to Magna Doodle. They run about uh, anywhere between $30 and $40. So the kids liked working with that. Once I realized what I already had, I also used analog technology in my classroom. So if I didn't have an extra device, for my digital workstations, I said, why not have them just do some of their thinking and cognition on and transfer and apply it to paper? So I made bulletin board um, activities for the kids to do. We were reading uh, Dr. Doolittle as a read aloud. So one of the activities the kids did was if our characters had Instagram, so they really had to think about put themselves in their character shoes and what would their characters see and observe. Um, within the story. And then what sort of comment or caption, thinking about like nonfiction, what caption would they leave to go with this picture? And then who would be their friends that would reply? So we were kind of thinking um, a little bit out of the box for anal using analog technology. 
And then, of course, the Siftio cubes were something that I, I had for the classroom that worked really great. And then once I had all of these devices, I said, what's going to work best for me to kind of plug in each workstation? And the kids were the ones. We sat down on the carpet and we said, what would this be good for? And they really kind of helped me decide where to put everything. And when I had all the devices laid out, it was so funny because they would pick up the flip cam. They're like, what is this? I'm like, oh, that's a video camera. I forgot I even had that. So we put it in our partner reading workstation. And the kids loved interviewing one another after they would do their partner reading to just talk about character motivations and to ask each other thick and thin questions. And it really also served as a bonus for me because it was a, um, a management piece. The kids were always on task and they you know, were recording themselves the whole time. And it was a great tool later for me to go and listen back to to kind of see those conversations that they were having with one another to see what I would need to work with when I would pull them for that small group T for teacher workstation. And I also love to use Erasma. This is an augmented reality app that I would use. And when I'm in workstations, this is like my guided reading time, but I really just call it my guided learning time because sometimes I might need to pull a group for something social studies related or something math related. It might not always just be reading. So I really just call it my guided learning time. And during the guided learning time, that T for teacher, when they come to me and I have them in a small group, I need for my kids to be as independent as possible when they're in those rotating digital workstations. So like the hot dot pens that they can use and get that yes or no feedback for correct or incorrect, I like that because the kids know if they are right or wrong and they can independently be learners and be able to check their own work. And with Erasma, I can do a very similar thing. I got the idea to do this from home when I was working with Jacob. It always seemed to happen that my five-year-old would need help exactly when my nine-year-old was in the middle of doing, you know, converting fractions to decimals and I'm sitting next to her in fourth grade math and we're really kind of learning together and then Jacob would come up, Mommy, I'm trying to read this book and I don't know what this word is. So as a parent, you're torn. You're trying to help both children and maintain focus with one while allowing the child um, who's reading to also be able to help. So I decided to kind of put Erasma overlays, auras, or is what they're called, over some of Jacob's books, he's five, so that he can be independent as a reader and he wouldn't need to interrupt Riley when she was doing her homework. So I practiced this at home and then once I saw how wonderful it worked, I said, I have to bring this into my classroom. So what I would do is I would preview the sight words that are in Jacob's book and I would just make a quick video, like 20 or 30 seconds, and I would say, on the video, I would videotape the book with the sight words and I would say, okay, Jakey, mommy's going to review the words with you when I point to a word. I say, you say, ready, was, and then I would pause and wait and he would, it's so cute because when you do that on a video, you can hear the kids are actually saying it back to you. So anytime Jacob got stuck in a book, um, he could close it back to the cover, hold the iPad above the cover of his book, and then the Erasmus app would immediately play the video that I recorded so Jacob could see that word that I was pointing to, hear the word, and then practice the word. So then he could go back in his story and continue to be independent without needing me in, in real time as a person. He had me in real time virtually. And on my blog, conspiration.com, I have a free ebook that walks you through its 19 pages. And it's just a bunch of screenshots showing you exactly how to get set up with this. And if you just Google Clinspiration and Erasma or Clinspiration and Augmented Reality, you'll find it. And it's a free download um, for 19 pages to get you started. And if you have older children, I've had many teachers tell me that they've just printed off those 19 pages and put that in a digital workstation. And then those kids can just take it and be independent as well. And it's a great resource to send home with parents if they ask for support as well. So with all these digital workstations, I had to find, oh my goodness, where am I going to have the space to do this? Because I didn't want the kids at uncomfortable desks, kind of working side by side. I wanted them to be comfortable. I wanted them to be able to have these digital resources to be able to produce and create and talk with one another without interrupting the guided learning groups that I was having in small group. So I really had to take everything out of my room. It was a big mess. There were times where I was almost brought to tears thinking, oh my gosh, is this ever going to get back to normal again? But it was really worth it. I was able to take everything, reorganize my entire space, um, 
then I decided to go deskless because I realized that the kids needed to be able to move furniture quickly and get in different groups and they really needed a space that was going to work for them. So this is what my room looks like now. We just have two large tables and they can move these quickly and they're really responsible in moving the furniture around and configuring it the way that they need to for their learning and what works best for them. And they love being able to rise to a level of responsibility because they know that they are trusted. I find that my classroom management and the children's behaviors is, is a non-issue anymore because they're treated with the amount of respect like a young adult and they know that the minute that they stop acting in a responsible way, they are not treated with a level of responsibility from me. So I, I do not have a lot of issues in my room because the kids know um, the expectations and then they, they really want to rise to the occasion. We have areas like breakfast nooks in the back and I got this because I had that corner space which is just really weird and it was wasted in my room and I couldn't really do a lot back there and I wanted extra seating and you can fit a lot of six and seven year olds in that space with this breakfast nook. I got it at Walmart online for I think it was right around $230 or $290. It was not a lot of money, um, but it was difficult to put together, but I've got a great husband. Um, so I've got a lot of floor space too. We often just push these big round tables to the back of the room and spread out with clipboards on the floor, and I love that, and the kids love it too. So what I was doing during this teacher time was my guided reading time and when I would meet with my small groups, but really it was my guided learning time. Sometimes we would do um, different technology pieces and sometimes I would just conference with them for writing. Sometimes I would do running records. Sometimes we would just talk and build relationships. It really just depended on the group and what they needed. Sometimes it was working on three-digit subtraction. It really just depended on what the kids needed, but it was very, very differentiated. So by flipping my spelling and my handwriting, I really had more time to do anything that the kids needed in these workstations. And we would sit down and plan together. I'd say, okay, guys, out of everything we're learning this week, you know the workstations. What sort of activities do you want to do that you can demonstrate your learning? And what sort of projects do you want to create together? And they've just come up with some really amazing ideas, knowing that it's not about the tools that we have available, but it's just about them demonstrating their learning and what they can do. So a few other resources that I want to share that we use, one of them is Biblionasium. This is one of my absolute favorite websites for literacy. The kids love getting in there and finding the books that they've read and adding them to their bookshelves and then recommending them to other students in class. Um, like, hey, you should read this, it's a great book. And it's similar to what Shelfari would be for an adult, um, but it's for kids. And the teacher can just set up student accounts. The parents can be involved as well if you want that. I am personally not a big fan of reading logs. I think that children should be in a more organic um, environment to where they're talking about the books, um, not just recording the amount of pages that they read each night. So Biblionasium is a great resource for me to be able to do that, to be able to track what the kids are reading. And but I don't want to do it because I'm tracking. I want to do it because I'm interested. I need to know on my Scholastic book order, what sort of book should I order for the next issue? What are they interested in? What's going to fly off the shelves as soon as I put them on there for the kids to read? So Bibliomasium, the kids can add the books that they're reading. They can also search for books by genre or by author. Um, and then they can get many different suggestions and add to like their wish list for books to read next and it helps when they go to the library too because they always have an archive of ideas for books that they can't wait to read next so the librarian knows exactly kind of how to help them. Go Animate is another website. The children can add characters and have the characters talk to each other and produce movies and then down below that you'll see where it says Story Arc. This is an app called Toontastic where the kids could really work on the plot of a story and with this free app, it's phenomenal. They can create stories either um, for creative writing or to retell a story that they're reading or really just to be creative in any way. Another one that I like to use, um, Tween Tribune, they have nonfiction articles that are of high interest for kids to read. And they also have um, Tween Tribune, just regular, and then Tween Tribune Junior. So the kids love just getting on there, reading some of the articles, and then commenting and leaving responses back. And of course, we have lessons about what comments should be and you know how to leave a proper comment and things of that nature as well. 
And we did a lot of grammar instruction in for that too. The next part I want to talk about is really just kind of bragging a bit on some of the creative work that my kids do. And a lot of what I'm going to show you now is um, writing specific to our standards that we have to do, but how the kids have thought of ideas of how to kind of bring technology into these projects that originally did not have technology integrated. So within Reading and Writing Workshop, we do an artist study where we talk with the art teachers and collaborate with them. The kids select an artist to study. They start by reading a book. And then at the end, they publish um, their information. And we just publish for this particular project on index cards. We keep it simple because it is more about the learning. It's not creating something super elaborate and fancy on special template paper and all of that. We just use index cards. So as the kids are researching, they are learning, you know, where to put commas in between the dates and learning periods and grammar and, you know, proper nouns and where to kind of how to start your sentence, how to take part of the question, make it part of the answer. Again, this is kind of middle of the year second grade, so a lot, some of them are still seven, some have turned eight, and they're really just learning how to take information from a book and to put it into their own words without plagiarizing, and then also how to give credit to the book from where they received it. In art class, the kids work on taking the inspiration of the artist and creating their own piece on Canvas. So after the kids have created a piece of art and they've researched their artist, we, it takes about two weeks for us to do this. Then we have a huge museum gallery walk. The kids love this. Within Writing Workshop, we publish our stories. And we always have a celebration when we publish. For this particular celebration for our artist unit, we set up our chairs around the room and we remove the furniture and then the kids put on their chairs their artwork and then we even order special t-shirts. The parents all give five dollars for each student and we work with a t-shirt company and the kids get their fancy um, BIA, the Brookside Institute of Art. They get their very own t-shirt so they feel totally official for this part of our celebration. And the kids put their art canvas on the back of the chair, and then they become the docent of their museum art display. And all the second grade classrooms rotate. We kind of, the teachers set up a schedule, and we take about 15 to a minutes to a half hour to go to each of the other second grade classrooms and to walk around the museum that they've set up in the classroom so the kids can have a chance to really talk about their artists, the research that they've done, and how they can, um, created their piece of art, too. For our nonfiction, oh, you know what, I did forget to mention, um, something that the kids asked this year is can they use, we now have an iPad cart in our room that we're allowed to share with all of the second grade classrooms, so we have a set of iPads that we share. So the kids can be one-to-one, -one, um, but not all day. We have to share them with the other second grades. So the kids love the app Sock Puppets. S-O-C-K, Sock Puppets. So what they're doing now is they um, have decided to use Sock Puppets to tell about their artist. And this is not part of their publishing. This is actually part of their research. So we're on our fourth draft right now of Sock Puppet movies because each day as the kids learn something new about their artist and as they're researching more, they are taking these puppets. One puppet character might be the artist and one might be the student or one might be like a teacher and the other be a student, or one might be like a grandma and the other be the student and the student's telling the grandma all about the artist. But it's really cute. They have complete creative freedom to do um, their sock puppets movie the way that they would like. But it's just a really engaging way for them to share out as a quick five minutes at the end um, the information that they've learned about their artist. And they're having so much fun sharing their work each day. For our nonfiction unit that we do, uh, for writing workshop is, of course, first we do a lot of immersion in reading workshop to where we learn about all of the animals, but each child gets to pick their own animal, and we get to go to different websites, and even a lot of the zoos around the country now have cameras. I know that the uh, Columbus Zoo has one that you can go to online and view certain animals and certain habitats in real time, and the kids think that that's really fascinating. So I've put QR codes on some posters around our room that if they scan using the iPads, it'll bring them directly to some of these zoos around the world so that they can view the animals in their habitat. And we do a lot of research with this, starting with Reading Workshop. We take a lot of our mentor text and we start tabbing those books. And the, I hide a lot of the headings in the books so that the kids don't see those. And they're just reading the text and information. And then we talk about, well, what would the heading be? What do you think? What is this mostly about? And we kind of 
deconstruct books so that we can construct our own stories. And the children really get down to the nitty gritty with this, creating their own books using scissors and glue sticks and cutting out and researching. And sometimes they use iPads to research. Sometimes they use books. I really like bringing in mixed media into the classroom. And then they work in partnerships. Um, two kids have the same animal that they've agreed upon. And they really dig deep into research. They think we study nonfiction text features. And they start adding headings and captions and sidebars and did you knows. And they have a glossary. And they think about their power words or their bold words. And they make an index. And some of them that are quote, finished early, create like an about the author page or a dedication page. And they really start to challenge themselves. Uh, this is a very loud, messy time in our room. But there's a lot of learning going on. It's fantastic. And then the kids who are done publishing, they like to do extension activities. Um, some of the kids like to make iBooks. And we just do this a very simple way because, again, I'm still working with groups and partnerships that need to kind of catch up or some that are still confused. And I'm also still trying to challenge and enrich the kids that need that as well. So one of the ways um, that I kind of challenge and encourage the other kids is to pick, pick a way that you want to share your work digitally. And David had decided to just make an iBook. So he quickly just took pictures of each page. He added his audio and read and told additional information and fun facts about his animal by making an iBook. And the app that we used for that was Book Creator. I believe that one might be $4.99. But we used it's um, iBook Creator. And that's what we used for that. And then we extend our lessons also using augmented reality. So this is Aaron. And Aaron was someone who was done early. And he wanted to keep going. He didn't want to start another nonfiction story. He was still very interested in sharing more information about monkeys. So he decided to make, and this is a project he thought of independently. He said, I'm going to make a poster like for the zoo to advertise, because I want everybody who goes to the zoo to be able to see the monkeys. But in order to go see the monkeys, they probably need to know a little bit of exciting stuff that will persuade them to want to go see the monkeys before they see anything else, even the polar bears. And I said, OK, Aaron, so what are you going to do? And he's like, I don't know yet, but let me make the poster. So he got to work, and he made a little poster. And then he decided to have one of his friends videotape him. Um, and his video started off something like, hey, it's Aaron from the Detroit Zoo. And you've got to come see the monkeys next Saturday with your family. Don't forget your water bottle, because it's going to be about 90 degrees. But when you come see the monkeys, and then he starts giving information about the monkeys that he had researched. But he did it in a really kind of like a commercial. So it was a really persuasive way. And little did he know that persuasive writing was our next unit of study. So this served as a great launching um, pad for our next unit. And it really worked out wonderfully. But what he did was he augmented, using Erasma, he augmented this poster so that when anybody in the class held an iPad using Erasma above his poster, instantly his video would appear, or his commercial for his monkeys at the zoo. So as, even as parents or other teachers you know, at conferences came by, they could see that too. And he was really proud of it. We also brought all the kids um, to the lab and signed up for a day. They got to make digital posters about their animals. And we used uh, some more, S apostrophe M-O-R-E. We used, it's a website, so we use samore.com to publish about our animals digitally. And so the kids would find different images and give credit to where they found those images. They would have different headings, and then they would share fun facts and information about their animals. And we were able to kind of hang these in the hall and really show off their work in a nice way, and also create a great bulletin for other children to see and learn from about animals, too. And it was so cute seeing even the kindergarten and first grade children come by and look at the animals. I didn't know that about sharks, or they would say something fun. And our second graders could feel so proud of the work that they did. And it was just a really great way to publish without necessarily even having a celebration or anything, but for the kids to show off their work. So I think I've been talking for a while. So I'm happy to stay on for questions and share any additional resources or how I get started or some other favorite apps or websites or student work. Thanks so much, Erin. I did capture some questions as we went. Uh, the graphics on the who would rotate slide, somebody asked where they came from. I think they were bumblebees. Uh, 
Um, I would have to check. I do not know off the top of my head right now. That would be something that I would have to check. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you use the this, this Stiftio cubes? Are they a choice or a planned activity? If, we're, if they're in um, a word work or the spelling rotation, if, for example, I don't have an iPad in the spelling station, um, and if the Stiftio cubes happen to be there for spelling for that particular week, mm -hmm. then the kids would work with making words. Or if they were in the math workstation for that week, then they would work on like adding some of the numbers together and doing a math activity. But what I did a lot of times with the Siftio cubes is they would be in the technology station because I like to give the kids choice over what activity they were going to do. And there's also just a lot of different creative games that come with the Siftio cube and um, like pouring liquids into one another or there's like some puzzle type games and the kids really get interested in challenging themselves to solve some of these puzzles. So sometimes they would just be in the technology station for the kids to pick what activity on the cube they would like to do. Thank you. Uh, can you explain what MobyMax is? Um, I have actually heard of MobyMax and I've heard that uh, a lot of people like using it. When I checked mm -hmm. it out, I did see that there, and if I'm not mistaken, a cost attached with it. It was presented mm -hmm. to me as if it were free. And when I went to go check it out, I saw that there was a 30-day free trial. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not 100%. I choose to kind of gravitate towards resources that either I already have a subscription to or that truly are free. But mm -hmm. um, it's just a math resource. OK. Um, for Go Animate, Speaking of free resources, um, do you primarily use the free re version of GoAnimate or is there an educational version? Um, I do tend to just stick with the free parts of it. Um, mm -hmm. I have not upgraded to use any additional features for GoAnimate. I, I know that they do have different plans and pricing that you can upgrade, but mm -hmm. I have not upgraded for that site. Okay. Have you ever done a project blending print books and technology, like in the library? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. This is Delane's question, recent question in the chat. Maybe Delane can explain a bit more. Um, while Delane's doing that, um, can you talk about how you use Class Messenger with your parents? Um, I, I have used Class Messenger, and I, I found that it's very similar to Remind 101. And for me, um, I know some people who are using Class Messenger, which is phenomenal. It's through Scholastic, who I highly believe in their products. Um, there's a lot more features with Class Messenger that you can do, like sending out polls and things like that. Um, however, at this current point in time, I'm using Remind 101 with, with my um, students and parents. Mm -hmm. So I use Remind 101 to send out same things that you can do with Class Messenger as well. So they both have these functionalities. Um, I send out like weekly new spelling words, and I send out links to videos that we've created using maybe animoto.com. Um, I also send out uh, pictures that I've taken of the kids throughout the day. So, you know, I might send out two or three pictures a week so that the parents can kind of see what's happening in the classroom. And then I also will send out reminders. Like in the morning, I'll schedule them out to go, you know, about 7 a.m. or something. Like, don't forget your packed lunch for the field trip today and things like that so that parents can quickly be reminded as they're pulling out of the driveway about items that their kids might need. So I use it in many different ways. Or if we have an alternate dismissal, I'll shoot out a quick reminder at like 2.30, don't forget we're meeting here today for dismissal or different things like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I, there are two related questions about Erasma. Uh, do you create your Auras online or on the iPad? And can you explain a bit more about how you use Erasma? I have done both, mm -hmm. but what I find is for me, doing everything on the iPad is a lot easier. So what I do is I have a Max Cases, M-A-X, Max Cases makes a really great stand 
for the iPad. It attaches to the table and it has like a movable swivel arm that the iPad can sit in. So, and you can lock it in there for safety and security. So I put my iPad on this really sturdy station and then I flip it around so it's facing down towards the table so that I can be hands free to kind of show whatever I need to without holding the iPad. Or you can obviously have a student hold the iPad and record you. Um, but I use my Max Cases stand and what I'll do is I'll put um, an activity page or directions or a blank sheet of paper or something under the iPad as I'm explaining how to do something or, or demonstrating a, how to do a, an algorithm. And what I'll do is I'm just recording this in the regular camera roll. So nothing fancy. I'm just recording in the regular camera roll. And I try and keep all of my videos about at a minute and a half or under. And after I explain how to do something or share information, now I have that video in my camera roll. So then I will open up the Erasma app. And then there's a plus sign down at the bottom for you to plus for you to add and create a new one. And I take a picture of what I want the trigger image to be. So whatever it is that I want to come alive when people put the iPad above it, that's what I snap a picture of when I'm in the app Erasma. And then it'll ask what aura you want to put. So I click add. And then it takes me to my camera roll so that I can select that video. And I click it. And then it process and processes and renders that video. And then I add it to my class channel. Now, setting up a class channel is something you have to do first. And I did that on the um, web. So on the computer, I first set up my class channel ahead of time. And I just called it Mrs. Klein's class. And then when I add this video to my class channel, it's just with the click of a button now because I've already signed in and logged into the mm -hmm. app. So then I just add that video above that trigger image and the app walks you through it step by step. Mm -hmm. And um, then anyone who has subscribed to my class channel, which I've already sent an email out to all my parents in the beginning of the year for them to do that, to subscribe to my class channel, um, I actually put the link in Remind 101 so it's just texted to them as well in addition to an email so that everybody is subscribed. And it's secure too. So that way parents don't have to worry like, well, what if my kid is in a video? Can anybody walk by and put their iPad above it and see that kid's video? Nope, only if they're subscribed to the class mm -hmm. channel. So mm -hmm. it's safe and secure that way. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was related to one of the questions and which had to do about uh, privacy issues that you might have had to deal with. Um, the, the question specifically, any privacy issues that you've had to deal with? Um, I, because I am affiliated with Scholastic, in mm -hmm. order for me to be able to blog about the children, they had to sign a legal release. Mm -hmm. So I'm allowed to post the pictures of the kids, and, and all of my parents have signed waivers and releases for that. Mm -hmm. However, prior to doing that, um, I just via email asked parents if we're going to do ahead of time, we're about to do this project, this is an example of what it would look like. And sometimes I'll just record my own kids, Riley and Jacob, mm -hmm. and so that the parents can see an example of what I'm talking about. And they write back either, yes, this is fine with me, or no, it's not. And I've never gotten a no, it's not OK. Mm -hmm. um, parents are always OK with it. As long as they know what I'm talking about ahead of time, they can see the good learning that will come out of it and how much their kids would enjoy the activity. So my parents often just say yes. Sure. Uh, another question I had had to deal with that, uh, one earlier that was a bit confusing. Have you ever done a project in collaboration with the librarian? You mentioned doing a project in collaboration with the art teacher. Our librarian at our school um, has her own set of curriculum that mm -hmm. she is um, tied to and that she enjoys doing with the kids. So I have not had the opportunity to do that yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think those were the questions. Somebody did ask, can you explain the t-shirt project again? For the t-shirt project, that was for our artist unit. And just as part of the celebration, we give each kid um, one of their own t-shirts. And it's just a solid blue. It's like a soft blue color. And in the upper corner, like by the shoulder area for the logo, it says BIA. And then under it, it says Brookside Institute of Art. And then it has some sort of like 
fancy drawing or something on it um, on the back. And it looks like a picture frame with like a piece of artwork in it. And the kids are given that shirt and it's like, okay, boys and girls, wear this shirt tomorrow and you're going to be the docent of your museum and you get to talk and share all about your artist piece that you've drawn and share all the information you've researched and learned about your artist. So they get really excited because it just makes it seem, the t-shirt just makes it seem more like they're getting dressed up for the occasion and mm -hmm. they truly are going to be the docent of their museum and art exhibit. So it's just something extra that we do for the kids because they enjoy it. That's great. Um, where do your, do your students keep their books and uh, personal items in their in the classroom? Without we dust? have no. um, bookshelves in the back of the classroom, mm -hmm. and the kids just keep their supplies and materials back there. And I have classroom jobs in my in my room, and I used to have kids rotate and have like a different job each week. And mm -hmm. what I found is the kids would forget, oh, who's secretary this week? Who's supposed to answer the phone? Or who's watering the plants? And then my mm -hmm. plants would die. And it, was, it became more of a management piece for both of us. So anytime that a, an activity or something that's meant to be fun and meaningful becomes more laborious, I, I have to reevaluate and say, okay, this isn't working. We need a better system or structure. So the kids in the beginning of the year, this year, it's the first year I've tried it, they just looked around the room and thought about what jobs do we need. Um, so we might not need somebody to water the plants. We might not need somebody to sharpen pencil. But they looked around the room and were, what needs to be done. So the kids actually um, created their own job. And then they wrote the dimensions of performance for their job and what they would be held accountable and responsible for. And if they wanted to have any coworkers, um, and they couldn't have more than one coworker. Um, so, and a lot of them chose to partner up on jobs, and together they wrote, you know, those performance outlines of what their job would encompass, and that's their job for the year. So we don't switch jobs, mm -hmm. and the kids, you know, in the beginning of the year, they were like, wait, so we have this job all year? So what, mm -hmm. like, even for, like, at the third week of school, and they're like, we never switch jobs, and as soon as I explained it, like, I'm your teacher. I'm not going to leave you in three weeks and go work at the zoo or go work at, you know, the grocery store. I'm here. I'm here for you. I, this is my job all year. So they were like, ooh, they got really excited about having their own job all year. And then they even felt, like, more professional about it because for them, all of a sudden, it seemed real. Like, mm -hmm. you know, my mom and dad don't switch jobs every day. So, and it really worked out for me because now they are so proficient at quickly getting the materials, passing mm -hmm. them out. Like everybody is an expert and knows what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. It's oh, awesome. that's terrific. Yeah, that is very, very awesome. OK, I think I've exhausted the questions. We'll go ahead with our close. And I think I'm going to turn the mic over to, to Peggy for this. Thank you so much, Erin. That hour just flew by. And I know that people are going to want to go back and watch the recording again just to slow it down a little bit so they can actually go explore some of those amazing links that are in the live binder that will help all of you find things easier uh, when you start looking at it later. We are also very excited that next week we have another featured teacher coming up. Uh, it just turns out that these sessions are back to back. but. We all love the featured teachers. And Donna Roman is going to be our featured teacher next week. And she is actually, um, I want to say, she's a fifth grade teacher and, um, in Illinois. And she won the SIG Online Learning Award last year uh, for her outstanding teaching. So we can hardly wait to have her as our guest. In the next two weeks, we have no show. Easter weekend in the US on the 19th. And on April 26th uh, is the DEN virtual conference. And lots of us like to go to that. So uh, the links to join that will be on our website. And I hope that a lot of you can, can participate in that. 
on May 10th. We have a great show coming up with Donna Hatcher, who has created an amazing light binder about bullying. And she's going to share her light binder and all of the activities and resources. And we're going to be joined by the Live Binder co-creators, Tina Schneider and Barbara Talent, who will share some of the latest new features on Live Binders. So we're excited about all of those things. Also want to let you know there's another fabulous event going on tomorrow. And it is the Reform Symposium mini conference. And what this is is just leading up to the big conference, which will be in July. But this mini conference is a half day, and it's all free. It's kicking off with um, a rapper, Jason Levine, and then our keynote speaker for the morning is Steven Anderson. And throughout the day, there are eight um, it's actually a half day. It's not even a whole day. There are eight Inspire presenters. And I know that if you click on that link, you'll see some people you know there. And then we're having a technology smackdown. It's not too late to sign up. If you might like to come on and share a tool in that smackdown, you just have I think two minutes to share it. But there's a form on that link. So fill in the form. And please join us for a fabulous day tomorrow uh, at the Reform Symposium Minicon. And with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Lori to finish wrapping up. And thank you all so much for being with us today. Thanks, Peggy. A Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's newest endeavor, and he has gathered together all of his teacher resources in one place. Also there is the um, Host Your Own Webinar again. If uh, you remember Illuminate's Host Your Own Webinar. So that's you can get to that at the Learning Revolution Project. You can nominate a featured teacher yourself or nominate yourself at tinyurl.com slash CR2O Live Featured Teacher Nominate without the E at the end. Uh, fill out that form to nominate yourself or another teacher. Susie, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. You might be able to find that on the Learning Revolution site. Um, when you exit the show, you should get a link for the Classroom 2.0 Live survey, or you can take the link that will be in the chat box. The link is also in the Live Binder. You can um, complete the survey in one of, from one of three places. Part of the survey is requesting a professional development certificate. That's at the bottom of the survey. Please make sure that you use a personal email rather than a um, school email. A lot of the times, the school email addresses will block the certificate from arriving. The recordings are available in either a video collection or audio collection on uh, iTunes U, once iTunes U cooperates again. As, and there are um, accesses to the show archives on the website itself, the Classroom 2.0 Live website. For instance, you can actually take the full recording right from the website in the show archives. You can also get an RSS feed of the archives. Again, special thanks to Aaron Klein, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, for Weebly.com for providing our website, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Uh, we'd also like to thank Blackboard Collaborate for providing the uh, forum where we can meet each week. Again, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, please remember that in order for the recording to process that you do need to log out of the classroom.